you. Uh, everyone, if you uh, just want to grab your seats, we'll get started here. We've got a great panel lined up. Uh, my name is Michael Horn. I'm the Executive Director of Education for Inosite Institute. We're a nonprofit think tank uh, devoted to applying the theories of disruptive innovation uh, to problems in the social sector and in the education field, seeking out a uh, student-centric system. So we have a very interesting uh, panel today uh, before you. Uh, to debate whether the technology innovation that we see coming in higher education is uh, disruptive or destructive. Um, my, my bias may be clear to you and some of the others up here, but we're going to try to shake it up a little bit and have some fun with it uh, and, and take some views uh, just uh, to uh, really provoke conversation. And after we've done a round of questions uh, up here and, and hopefully had some good conversation among the panelists, We'll kick it out to you at the end for some questions to uh, whomever or multiple people up here that you'd like. Uh, representing us on the panel, we've, we've got a really distinguished group I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Um, we've got Andrew Clark, the CEO and president of uh, Bridgepoint Education. Uh, we have, uh, then next we have uh, Pam uh, Quinn, who's uh, the uh, LaCroix Center Provost at Dallas Community Colleges. Um, and then uh, right next to her, we have Rusty Grief, uh, I, Russell Grief, I guess formally, but I'll, I'll, we call him Rusty, um, who's the Chief Strategy and Development Officer at Grocket. And then uh, next to him, we have Gunnar Councilman, who is the uh, CEO and founder of uh, Fidelis uh, Incorporated. So uh, I, what I'm going to do right now is rather than me tell bios, we're just going to run down the line and everyone will give about 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, just about what you guys do, about what your organization does, and your background, just so we can root the conversation with everyone knowing where you stand. So go ahead, Andrew. Sure. Uh, so my name is Andrew Clark. I'm the CEO of Bridgepoint Education. We're a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, Bridgepoint owns and operates uh, two universities, Ashford University and University of the Rockies. 99% uh, of our students are online. Uh, Bridgepoint was founded back in 2004, uh, and we've also... Um, made some recent uh, investments into a variety of different uh, technologies that uh, center around uh, improving the student learning experience. I'm Pam Quinn, provost of the LaCroix Center for the Dallas County Community College District, and um, for that means that I'm really the CEO of this organization. And um, this is sort of a unique um, operation within community colleges in that um, I run an online campus. It's a virtual college on behalf of our seven on-ground campuses. We produce courseware, since we've got McGraw-Hill here, um, in partnership with many publishers such as McGraw-Hill. Um, we have all the instructional and educational IT people reporting to me, and in a lot of institutions, IT is under one roof, and we have it separated from administrative to education. And um, then we have a lot of services that we provide our colleges, such as a cable channel, um, our LMS, and um, all the support services in the area of instructional technologies. Um, I've worked in this field for a number of years and have seen many, many changes. Um, I also can speak from a national perspective in that I chair the National University Telecommunications Network called Newton. And I also work with something new called the Online Community Colleges.org project. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Michael. Great to be here. Uh, I'm Rusty Greif with, uh, with Grocket. We are a uh, social learning, adaptive learning gaming company out of San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Uh, we uh, launched around three plus years ago. We already have over a million plus students that are part of our platform. We have global presence. We're in 169 countries now. Um, we literally on a daily basis have students from around 45 countries um, that are learning from each other. We've created a platform that we believe is truly disruptive and is kind of transforming how students are learning um, both at the K-12 level and the virtual level and now in the post-secondary level with community college and virtual schools as well as for-profits and nonprofit universities. Um, and what we do is we've created a platform that allows students to learn solo in their own experience, highly personalized with deep adaptive learning and assessments, as well as peer-to-peer. -peer. So literally a student-to-student -student experience, a faculty-to-student experience that has a real global uh, impact related to uh, curriculum and, and uh, efficacy. And then finally, we do engage online tutors, online faculty um, to use Grokit. We have grokit.com, but we also have built private networks uh, around the world that literally are branded by the university or branded by the institution that are partnering with us. So i um, excited to talk about the perspective really from the consumer and student-centric as well as how we're partnering with institutions. 
Awesome. Um, my name is Gunnar Councilman. I founded a, comp a technology company out in San Francisco in Silicon Valley called uh, Fidelis. And we've partnered with the University of California and a, and a number of other leading universities to solve the military to civilian career transition problem. So essentially the way that our, the way that our uh, solution works is students find us while they're on active duty, start taking online, primarily online, but blended classes from the University of California or another partner, earn credits from those universities, as soon as they get out, we then place them into the best, what we think of as traditional, real college we can get them into, coach them through to graduation, pick them up in the back end, and place them into companies. So it's an end-to-end -end career transition uh, education solution. Terrific. Uh, and now we'll, we'll get to dive into the uh, topic of uh, the panel, which is, is disruptive innovation actually improving American higher education, its affordability, uh, it's access, quality, and relevance, relevance, or is it undermining what has made it great is the uh, question that we were uh, put forward with. I thought I'd start with quickly defining what disruptive I innovation is so we have a working definition, and then uh, I'll dive in with my first question. Uh, a disruptive innovation is one that transforms an industry characterized by products or services that are expensive, inaccessible, deeply centralized, and complicated to use, and therefore can only serve a limited few and transforms that product or service into one that's far more affordable, convenient, accessible, simple to use, and therefore can be used by many more people who previously didn't have access uh, to the mainstream product or service. And it transforms that industry over time. And so with that as a backdrop, what I, the first question, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Andrew. Um, Talk about the disruptive innovation that, that Bridgepoint has really brought to the market. Why is it disruptive? Uh, how is it extending access and affordability? And, and I guess you certainly talk about Bridgepoint and how that lays into it, but the online learning industry in general, we've, we've characterized as broadly speaking a disruptive innovation. How does that general industry, how has it affected those questions? Yeah, sure, Michael. Well, uh, at Bridgepoint, we actually started back in 2004, um, and it was a complete whiteboard entrepreneurial process where our, our main goals were increasing uh, access to a college education and affordability. And how could we do that uh, using technology? Um, I think we've been pretty successful. We had no students back then, and today we have over 90,000 students between our two institutions. Um, and so our efforts to make a quality college education accessible and affordable uh, definitely has resonated. And back then, of course, um, there weren't a lot of, there was a lot of skepticism about online learning and, you know, today one in five college students in this country takes at least one online course. Uh, so I think Bridgepoint definitely has, has played a role um, over the past six, seven years um, in, in positive disruption and creating greater access uh, at a much more affordable tuition rate to college students in this country. I think the industry um, uh, as a whole has, um, has definitely led in terms of online learning and, and its approach to that. Um, and you see that obviously now um, extending throughout all parts of higher education and, and, and K-12 as well. Um, and I, I, think, I, I think that will continue. Uh, the innovation uh, in, in our industry I think will continue. Our, our sector has always seemed to be kind of the first um, to get there in, in regards to innovation and in ways in which uh, you could innovate in higher education, and and I think that's that's been to the benefit um, of all of higher education as a whole, um, because oftentimes then you do see other institutions uh, uh, adapt, embrace uh, those innovations, and and um, and even improve upon them. So, I think that's uh, I think that's how our sector has played a role. I think I think you know Bridgepoint itself uh, has done that primarily through its institutions, although we've gotten into mobile learning and now. Um, Today with Thues, we have a digital learning platform, uh, which, we're, um, which, which we have tested out and used and provided for our students at our institutions, but now we're providing uh, on a beta basis for uh, students at, at other colleges and universities um, uh, where they're going to have an opportunity to, to use the uh, textbook through the platform and, uh, and be able to um, provide us with information and uh, back on, on how the platform performs. Terrific. That, I, I think that starts to give us a grounding that we're going to dive into some of these questions a little bit deeper as we go on, but it's also a perfect segue to Pam, um, because uh, hi historically speaking, 
existing organizations have had a lot of trouble introducing disruptive innovations. You're, you're in an institution that's had distance learning, though, for 40 some odd years, I believe. Uh, you're, you're in charge of a campus of online learning, as you said. What's that process? Take us inside an existing institution uh, trying to pioneer a disruptive innovation itself. Hard? What's the, uh, what, what's the leadership challenge? What, what, what are the pitfalls? T take us through that. Well, the title of this, this session is Disruptive or Destructive, and I would say that it's definitely destru destructive, but a lot would also say that um, it is, it's very disruptive, but also some would say it's destructive because there are a lot of um, faculty and a lot of institutions and, and a lot of uh, people working in these institutions that really have been very proud of the quality education American institutions have provided to our students. As it was stated earlier, we've been the um, leader in higher education for a number of years and it really wasn't the online learning that got us there, it was the uh, bricks and mortar uh, experiences that our students have had. So a lot of things are changing. And um, what happens within institutions, and I notice I'm really the only public institution up here representing uh, two and four year schools. So that's where most of us uh, have been. That's where our familiarity is. And so in a lot of ways, it's easier to start up a new company like in 2004 and hit the ground running towards one target. But when you're working with an institution that has been um, you know, in the same kind of learning mode for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's not easy to make quick change. Now, I've worked with, with an institution and we were able to make some pretty rapid change in the beginning. And a lot of institutions were able to make rapid changes immediately when we saw where the future was going. But the interesting thing is as long as um, this was on the periphery, it wasn't threatening. And in a lot of cases, faculty just said, you want to do that distance learning stuff, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, my background goes to when we work with public television and because we couldn't produce things that um, everybody else could do, it was fine, it was on the side. But once we really got into the mainstream, working with faculty who feel that their jobs are really threatened, um, not just their jobs, but what they want to do with their jobs. They like the autonomy they've had. Um, they like the fact that um, they can be the masters of what it is that they teach and create. And in this environment, a lot of things are changing that and it's threatening. So um, things moved rapidly, then it became more mainstream, and I th I've seen a lot of um, really good starts kind of slow down. Uh, we are not creating courses at scale as well as, say, something at Bridgeport would do. Um, when we hire our faculty, um, we haven't been able to say to them, you're going to do something this way, you're going to change. Uh, they can push back and say, no, we're not going to change. And uh, they've got unions there in place and they've got the numbers in place. So I think starting something brand new from scratch is easier to, to leap into the future than it is to transition some of our institutions. Um, Michael Powell stated that there might be quicker change at the K through 12 level. And in fact, that may actually be true eventually because the culture there is different. It is very top-down driven in a lot of ways. And in um, public in education, there's gonna have to be a lot of change in the culture itself. So it is disruptive and some would say it's destructive, but there's no doubt it is changing and we are moving forward. And um, it's just a matter of working with faculty letting them see what their role is the future and getting them involved. Uh, my sister is a junior high teacher and about four years ago, someone mentioned in the audience that their schools have laptops for all students. When this first happened, it not only meant that students were going to learn differently, but the really frightening part is teachers were going to have to teach differently. And uh, there was a big resistance to that. But Apple came in and worked with the teachers and within just months, the teachers began, began to really embrace the collaborative manner in which uh, this disruptive technology can work, uh, the way students learn, the way teachers teach. And so I think as we move forward, if there's good training for faculty and a good vision for the future, we can make a difference. But right now, it's still, it's still struggling, and you'll see pockets of innovation, pockets of uh, institutions that are doing something really new and exciting, and others that are, are slow to change. We all know what we need to do, but it's hard sometimes to get there. Perfect. Uh, I, I actually think that brings us perfectly into Gunner. Um, uh, Fidelis is sort of a new kid on the block, so 
trying to figure out uh, two, two fronts. A, you, you're partnering with existing institutions, so you're actually working with some of the faculty uh, in similar roles uh, that, that Pam just described. So I'm curious about that aspect of what you're doing. And then also, how do you think of yourself uh, as a disruptor in the space, uh, even though you're working with existing institutions, what's your rationale for being the new kid in the block compared to some of these uh, first movers in the online learning uh, uh, world, such as a Bridgepoint or University of Phoenix and so forth? Sure. Um, so first off, what, what Pam was just describing, I think is absolutely right. Like moving an entire institution um, from the old from the old into the new is incredibly hard, and my hat's off to you for, for giving it a go. Um, we have a, a really remarkable opportunity to, to, to work with leading universities, but work with the faculty members who want to be a part of the change. And so our opportunity is to build a, build a solution for students who have a major problem, which is they've been trained for one industry, the military, and they're going into other industries wherever, they're, wherever that happens to be, and then building the educational programs that go between, right? So we get to, to work with great faculty members to build build the course content, work with companies on the back end to understand what it is that they're looking for, and then train to suit, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable opportunity to bring together a bunch of different unique assets to solve that problem. Um, to answer the question about how is it, how is it disruptive, um, so a little bit of my background. I, I first heard the term disruptive innovation in 2003 when I was uh, at Harvard for Business School, and I had the unique pleasure of getting to work with Clay Christensen on uh, some early versions of, of the book that Michael ended up writing. Um, back then, it was just a, a bunch of terrible notes and, <laughs> and incoherent thoughts of mine. But uh, the, the way that we think about it is that there are a bunch of brilliant point solutions in the market right now. There are a bunch of really brilliant, uh, like Grokit is fantastic. Um, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful social adaptive learning engine, right? There are, there are innovations around recruiting students, around placing students, around how do people learn different things in kind of an individual point way. What we're doing that's really different is owning the problem from end to end, right? So we own the student from the time that they think they might want to go get education all the way to the point where they've been successful and on the job for two to three years, right? That's, our, that's the innovation that we're bringing to the table. So we have a really powerful opportunity to, to integrate all of those really clever technologies that are coming, coming out right now into something that works well for the overall transition experience, integrating great technology, great, great curriculum, great faculty to create a, to create a really um, useful transition educational service. So that's, we think that the, the, by, by focusing the problems of one market, if we can nail that experience and make it hyper viral, hyper, hyper powerful for these people, then we can take what we've learned from that market and take it into the next market, right? And then take it into the next market after that. But it's about really understanding the entire full spectrum of what do employers need, how do students learn, what do they need to, what do they need to build uh, to, to cover the gap. So, so that's actually a great transition uh, as, well, as well into Rusty because um, you're, you're, you're here not representing a college or institution, um, but, but uh, Gunner, Gunner just called it a point solution. Um, are, are you disrupting the disruptors? Are you un Are we talking about bun unbundling of higher education services? Go ahead and can clarify. I, can I? So when I when I was referring to point solutions, when I think of Grokit, I think of uh, it's a better way to learn a whole lot of stuff, right? So it's a much much more thoughtful way of bringing together people into an online collaborative learning environment um, than you see in most other places. So I, I think that it's a point solution in some ways, but it also touches so many different parts of the student's value, uh, student's experience that it, it could be much more. So Gunnar's also the chief marketing officer of Rocket, so I just want to uh, also unveil that today, just a full, full disclosure for everyone. So, so thanks, um, and thanks, Michael. Uh, I also feel badly for Pam and Andrew. I just realized that, um, I, I don't know complete backgrounds, but uh, you're sandwiched between uh, at least three Harvard Business School um, uh, graduates, so I apologize for that um, just in advance. Um, um, to Michael's point, and I actually want to follow up on, on, on things that, that Andrew and, and Pam talked about. Um, I mean, we, we entered the, the marketplace, obviously, to be exactly that, to be the disruptor's disruptor. Uh, I mean, we literally 
saw an extraordinary opportunity, uh, and the timing was such, of literally bringing in some of the leading educators, PhD thinkers in predictive ana analytics, adaptive learning, the whole movement of gaming and what was going on in the gaming marketplace with obviously what was happening in social with Twitter and Facebook. Um, it's, it's, it's not a surprise, we're Silicon Valley based, we're a San Francisco based company, um, and we literally have brought in some of the leaders in social thinking, Literally, we have five PhDs that are, are part of our company whose sole purpose in their PhD is all on social and collaborative learning, gaming mechanics related to creating a holistic approach to learning. Um, so we saw an opportunity initially, frankly, in test prep. Um, we saw that there were cost drivers that were having a significant problem related to democratizing college access. Um, and be able to better prepare students for a college experience. Um, instead of a $1,000 to $1,500 to $2,000 uh, price point, we literally had the ability to build something that was around $100 that was truly adaptive, that provided a peer-to-peer -peer model that was attractive and the ability to leverage that in a way that was fun and that was in, ga in gaming. Our ambition is large. We want to be the largest community in the world for learners. Um, and one of the things that we've realized is obviously the power of partnering with institutions to do that. Um, at the K-12 virtual school level and clearly at the for-profit um, and at the private nonprofit level, at the university level, because there's a need for that level of integration. Um, where we see some levels of disruption. I would say that um, when, it comes to, when it comes down to affordability, right, like um, there's a great study by the Parthenon Group, Parthenon group which is a, uh, which is a major consulting firm based out of Boston, and it showed that, like, yes, the cost to students might be fifty dollars a credit hour, but the total the total cost to taxpayers, government, um, etc. It, it's not that fundamentally different across across institutions based on based on uh, tax status, right? Whether they're, what what kind of institution it is, um, the the easiest way to lower prices is one thing, right? It's not complicated. Students teaching other students, period, right? Easiest way to lower prices is one thing, students teaching other students and then, and then ensuring the teaching happened, ensuring the student, the student learned what they're supposed to learn. Um, it's not like complicated to say it. It's not complicated for 20 of us to get together for coffee later and talk about how would we design that. The complicated part is making it happen within the institutions that we've got. Um, I actually think that the institutions we've got are, are, are wonderful places, right? I think that a world in 50 years without, without MIT would be a world worse off. I think a world in 50 years without the University of California, University of Arizona, um, T, uh, uh, UT in, in, Aust in Austin, right? The world would be worse off without those places, so it's incumbent upon, it's incumbent upon those of us who've, who understand the technology and who understand how to, build, how to build really good student learning experiences to partner with those folks in order to create in order to uh, allow those institutions to do what they do fantastically well while driving outcomes and lowering prices. If I could just piggyback on that, of what Gunnar said, I mean, you know, the context of this panel alone, you've, you've three, I think, really pioneer thinkers and that are doing really structural different things within existing or kind of incumbent organizations or brand new models, uh, the way Gunnar is launching with Fidelis. Um, you know, there's no doubt that, that and it was talked about earlier, I think Jim Applegate touched upon this, I, and, and Pam just nailed it, which is, you know, bolt-on technology is going to consistently raise costs, right? It's, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a old-school solution to an old-school model trying to do something very new and dynamic in education. That the formula just doesn't fundamentally work. It, 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 it impresses upon all of us in this room and beyond to really open our eyes to fundamental new models of teaching, of learning, as, as, as Gunnar just talked about, clearly we've drank the Kool-Aid at Rocket, we're building peer-to-peer -peer models on a global level, so we do believe, and we've seen, more importantly, significant efficacy, um, where literally we're seeing standard deviations of one to two growth in peer-to-peer -peer social learning models that literally are improving college readiness for students at a very scalable level that we think can literally improve students or allow access for students of upwards of 85 to 100,000 students a year, over a million over 10 years, all through a peer-to-peer -peer model. But that really does impress upon 
the overall marketplace understanding that that, that institution or that, that way of learning needs to be dramatically different. And so if we, if we approach that, if we use technology, if we leverage institutions appropriately, I think that's where it becomes really interesting. And cost drivers then really do start coming down because you're seeing now video-based learning, competency-based learning, right? Different approaches, as Andrew's suggesting, we're on the credit side of teaching um, and, and, and credit allocation. That's gonna really, really change. And, and obviously institutions are doing that right now. Right? We talked about Western Governors earlier today, but it's a great model to show a new level of, of efficiency and how people are getting degrees and how they're getting a level of competency that's having an impact on what, Gun what Gunner's doing right now at Fidelis, not just from an institutional standpoint in academics, but also in the workplace and employment. So I think that we're moving in the right direction, but like every revolution and evolution, it's going to take a long time for, for technology and for the consumer marketplace and for students to catch up in the process. I'm curious off of that because uh, credentialing has been, so there's a couple burning questions that I have now, but um, we've talked about existing institutions, credentialing, uh, lowering the price dramatically, how others are reacting. Um, Gunnar, you mentioned some uh, austere institutions there in your list of uh, institutions you hope are here in 50 years still. Uh, MIT, uh, with its announcement with yeah. MITx, uh, are, 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 are they doing it right, or are they, are they bolting it on? How, how do we think about what, what's going on there? I mean, that's a radically different credential. Yeah. No, I'm fired up about what MIT is. I'll, I'll get, tell everybody real quick if you're not familiar. So they just, they, for the last decade or so, they've been doing a open, open courseware from MIT. You can go on right now and uh, with your iPad and go find every course, I think, that's taught at MIT or some, some fraction of them, some high fraction of them. Um, what they've just done is to launch something called MITx, which allows you to actually earn a, a, a certificate of completion. Right, super good, super cool for us because we're now taking that out and talking to employers and saying, "Hey, does this mean anything to you guys?" Right? If somebody comes, if if a military guy comes out after 18 years of, 18, 20 years of service, um, where he was on a, he was in a nuclear sub, right, working on the reactor, for for 18, 18 years, and now he's coming out. Um, can he go through some curriculum, some, some curriculum here that proves that he's as smart as the guys you've got over here who came through MIT 20 years ago, right? Or that proves that he can go do these other kinds of jobs. Super interesting stuff, super useful. The key is really getting the employers to, getting the employers to know what's out there and to think of those signals that they can get out of, out of new kinds of credentialing systems in, in comparable ways, right? It's a really, one of the things that I think is, um, it's, a, it's a good thought experiment to put yourself through. So there are, I mean, how many, is it 4,200 4, accredited institutions in the country, right? We've yep. got mm -hmm. Bridgepoint, you guys bought, if memory serves, you guys yeah. bought a- um, Ashford University. Yeah. Ashford University, right? And then, and it was a, it was a, it was a university that was gonna go out of business. You guys buy it, you scale it up, you, you, you standardize certain aspects of it to allow it to scale and to maintain some maintain quality standards as you as you define them. Um, there are 4,200 of these of these schools out there, right? The question comes down to if you knew that somebody had a 2,400 on their SAT, which it's out of 2,400 now, um, or they graduated from college, right? You don't know where, you don't know what, you know, you don't know anything other than that that they graduated, what their degree was in, and maybe a GPA, but you don't know the, you, you don't know anything else, right? And it's not a school you've heard of, which would you rather hire? If those are the two data points you've got, which would you rather hire, right? Employers currently, by and large, a lot of the, certainly the established employers, they'd still go with the degree, right? Simply because that's written into a bylaw someplace. But as a hiring manager, how do you want to hire, right? Huge question, and, and until higher ed gets itself wrapped around that question, it's gonna have, there's gonna be a lot of open, open discussion around whether the credentials are as meaningful as we want them to be. I'll also say I think the accrediting agencies are gonna to have to get into this game and talk it very seriously. There are six accrediting agencies across the country and um, they're really all fairly different in how they operate. You won't find any um, uh, Bridgeport schools accredited in the uh, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools because the guidelines there really don't encourage that to happen. So I think um, nationally there are going to have to be some issues on the accrediting agency or there may just be a leapfrogging of um, the traditional accrediting and go to badges or go to you know, some of the other ways to credential um, learning. 
I mean, I, I just, if I can piggyback, uh, I think MITx totally rocks. I think it's absolutely rocks. creating a completely new dynamic in how people look at not only their education from a higher ed perspective, but as 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 Gunnar talked about, I mean, it really the, the question is, it's 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 redefining the value of the degree. And um, I think that that is a really um, challenging, terrifying question that's disruptive and for some very, destru very destructive as we're kind of going with the theme of the panel. Um, but I also think it is very much the future. I think the thing that's interesting about it, frankly, is that uh, MIT was able to get kind of ahead of the game on that and leverage their brand. I mean, one of the issues is, as, as Gunnar is talking about from an employment perspective, obviously, you have your top flight A-plus brands. If it's MIT, Stanford, um, uh, you know, Harvard, whatever it may be, clearly what Andrew and what Pam have done have shown the power of very strong education in a more cost-effective way that can't compete from that brand perspective, but they've created and refined a whole new level of value that is being really well received from the consumer marketplace and the student themselves, but also from an employment perspective. So I think it's interesting that MIT, um, as, 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 as extraordinary institution is, was able to look at, frankly, what the bridge points are doing, what community colleges are doing to some degree, understand it from, uh, from a cost-effective standpoint, and introduce a different model, and in some respects play, play a game that may be, you know, at least trying to level the playing field in its own way, even if the brand is MIT. So I think that's exciting and interesting in itself, and absolutely the future of moving ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the question is those brands have uh, have been built on exclusivity and, and to what extent do those brands want to maintain that? And if that's still paramount to those brands, which I believe that it is, then uh, what are you going to do for the other 95%? And the fact of the matter is you have 98 million Americans without a college education in this country and we have to do something to educate those people. Again, we have a competitiveness issue and our problem isn't that we have too much supply. In, it, in higher education, um, it's that we have too little of it. There's not enough access, and I think um, you know we need to do as much as we can to make sure that we're at the intersection of technology and in, uh, education, and that we're finding a way in which we can broaden that access uh, and we can leverage uh, students, uh, as as has been discussed, le leverage their knowledge. Really, you're going to see a, you see an unbundling of the in, the entire faculty role. You see disaggregation occurring here uh, in terms of education um, and it's really it, it's an exciting time I think it's an exciting time but it's one where we need to um, we need to be focused uh, as a community I think nationally in terms of of, of how we're going to uh, embrace this disruption and innovation so that we don't find ourselves falling further and further behind other countries so this is this is the one thing where um, the, the I think there's a a big question around destructive or disruptive, and quite frankly, like uh, disruptive innovation is by its very nature destructive, right? So Schum Schumpeter, Schumpeter, however you pronounce <laughs> that guy's name, Creative <laughs> Destruction, 1903, wrote about it, it's right, right? When new, new companies come along and create something that incumbents can't respond to, you destroy the incumbent, right? It's happened over and over again, it's what um, Clay Christensen talks about it as fruit flies, right? Um, he started studying disruptive innovation by taking a look at the disk drive industry because these companies lasted for five years, right? I read something yesterday that said that, the, that less, than, less than a tenth of a percent of, of corporations last for 40 years, right? They're constantly disrupting and destruct, uh, dis destroying one another. Um, the point, though, about whether or, not disrupt, whether or not higher education has actually had a disruptive wave, actual true disruptive innovation, is a big question for me because when you take a look at the growth of the of the major of the major for-profit for-profit schools, I don't see a lot of what I think of as disruptive innovation happening, right? And the reason I say that is that their innovation, most of the innovations have been around starting students, right? Expanding access. I'm not sure if that if in my book that fully counts because at the end of the day, you've got the University of California turns away like 140,000 students per year that they say no to, right? It's not, that they, it's not that they don't know how to get the people to want to go to school there. It's that they're saying we only, wanna, we only we want our, our credential to mean something to folks in the back end, right? And until new things like badges, like other stuff come along, how do you, how do you maintain the, the answer around what does that mean, right? First thing people ask when they, when they or first thing people look at. So if you, if you use some computer software to track people's eyes when they look at 
people's Facebook, or not Facebook, people's resumes and people's LinkedIn profiles. First thing to look at is what are you doing now? Like what's your job? Second thing they look for, they start scanning, looking for where you went to school, right? They're getting a signal out of that, right? And if they have never heard of the school before, they don't get any signal, right? So the, the, the point around like, the point around destructive or disruptive, the question, come, the question has to come down to how, to, to quote a former president, is our students learning anything, <laughs> right? Like, is our students learning? And the, the, the point is, is that higher education is not set up ideally now to measure that for a whole bunch of historical reasons. And so we don't know if there's been good disruptive innovations come along. It's about starting students but for the, a lot of the big companies. I, I totally agree with you, but I also think that the obvious point here is we're at the infancy of this. I mean, we're at such an early stage, um, and we're trying to, I think, disrupt and frankly to, to to Gunnar's point, destroy to a certain degree the fundamental ways that we have looked at higher ed and post-secondary education. Um, and so I, I always try to, um, at least for myself when I'm sleepless at night, try to put perspective on the timing of all this related to this, this level of inf infancy. Uh, infancy. I mean, I, I, as I said, you know, with my three children, I'm convinced that at least one of my three children, if not all of them, will not go to a traditional university. They're eight, six, and four. And I just believe that, again, the value yeah. proposition is going to be dramatically different uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And, um, and, so, and there's going to be, frankly, significantly more choices that are going to be democratized because of technology, because of courseware, because of different mobil mobility that's going to um, really question the validity um, from a learning standpoint, but also from uh, an employment standpoint of that traditional degree. So I, I think we, we need to be cognizant of how early stage we are right now in that process. So, yeah, so I, oh, I'm, I'm going to cut us off just so we can go to some audience questions, because I think we're just starting to hit a nerve where maybe we'll get some good ones. And then, <laughs> a Andrew, uh, uh, you can jump in there. So we're going to go around. The mic's uh, coming around. If you have questions, stand up um, uh, and, and uh, ask away. Uh, we've got one in the back, I see. Uh, and for your question, uh, just make sure it ends with a question mark, and uh, and then we'll uh, and, and we'll go from there. Andrew, if you want to, and and not okay. only that, but would you please again introduce yourself and where you're from, and keep your questions short, or I'll grab the mic back. Hi, Carlos Barrionuevo from uh, OVO Solutions. I, I just wanted to continue the theme here. What are some specific because the what are some specific strategies for changing employers' perceptions of the online, sort of the, the for-profit online, the newer experiences? I mean, you started to touch on them, but I wonder if you could elaborate some more on some specific things that you would tell employers and specific things you're doing to try to create that value proposition for them. Well, I think what's great about online learning, and we really haven't talked about it much here, you started talking about it, was um, the, the amount of data that now is available uh, to institutions, to faculty, to students around uh, a student's learning. Before you could say that students learned, but you couldn't really prove uh, that they learned. Now with the data, you can actually prove a student's learning, what they're learning, how fast they're learning, what their learning style is. Um, I mean, it's just tremendous, the information that is getting generated. And he's absolutely right. We're just at the very early stages here. Um, and it, 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 it provides a tremendous future. And I think for employers, eventually you're going to get to a point with, for employers where you know, they can pull up a potential employee's learning dashboard, so to speak, that shows, you know, here's quantifiably what they've learned, when they learned it, how, they, how well they learned it, what their learning style is. Uh, I think, you know, very plausibly, 10, 15, 20 years from now, what it means to go to college to an institution could be dramatically different, will be dramatically different than it is today. Oh, perfect, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff McDowell from uh, Desire to Learn. And I have a question that I, it might be just I'm naive, I'm three months into this, uh, after 20 years in mobility, I'm three months into the education space. And um, there's a word that hasn't come up this morning that concerns me because I think it's the key to disruption and I think Rocket have completely nailed it. And there was a question, there was an observation this morning about um, student-driven uh, disruption. And that word is engagement. Um, we haven't talked about that at all. And I think, isn't that the key to disruption? Or am I just completely yeah. uh, naive? Yeah. Um, we have a model that's based in, oh, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to do tests. I don't want to read that book. And I think what Grocket have done is turned it around and said, I totally want to get online right now so I can ask people questions about this 
thing I got coming up and I can socialize and stuff. Is, is, is that the key? I, I think it's a huge point, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up, and I'm sorry that I, I hadn't uh, kind of emphasized that more. Um, not surprisingly, um, in what we do at Grocket is we literally have taken some of the leading gaming designers in Silicon Valley that have, um, you know, that have, have brought their expertise, and we've created, beyond just traditional badges, point systems, all those kinds of things, really, frankly, fundamental algorithms and gaming mechanics that create levels of engagement that are pretty extraordinary, specifically to learning and education. So just an example. Um, on average, when you come to Grokit and you experience learning, uh, you know, whatever it may be, if it's algebra, whatever it is, we're content agnostic, by the way, so we work with publishers and universities to put their content in, we Grokitize it, we make it adaptive, we make it social, we put gaming mechanics around it. But on average, a student that experiences Grokit or a, a university or institution uses our Grokit platform as their private network, on average, they spend 35 to 40 minutes every time they're in Grokit. Um, it's a pretty extraordinary period of time when you're doing algebra, trigonometry, or, or American history, that you're spending 30 minutes plus, if not 40 minutes every time, and it is an issue of engagement. So we do believe very strongly, and if you make something, um, it doesn't always have to be fun, but if you make it social, if you make it engaging, if you make it fun, you are going to be able to have a level of engagement that is different than what we've seen before in learning, and that ultimately, at the end of the day, what matters is that's translated for us into levels of efficacy that we've seen in these jumps from standard deviations and test scores and uh, mastery and competency. So we do believe that's a big part of it and, and I think that's clearly a whole movement that's not Grokit obviously, there's a whole movement of interesting dynamic gaming companies and learning companies that are, that are really using consumer social, consumer gaming um, and putting that around academic gains. And, and I think that's right. I think um, the thing I would add to it is to say engagement is, is one thing, right? And engagement, um, engagement is about getting people addicted to the learning, addicted to the accomplishment, addicted to that sense of like moving forward and, and getting better at something. And that's, that's first and foremost, we can learn a ton from the gaming industry about that. But the other aspect is, is and all that's like ends up being somewhat intrinsic, somewhat extrinsic, but the other aspect is true motivation, right? like actually going through something that sucks because it's worth it, right? So I want to marry up uh, Rusty's son who is into, into gaming and explosions with an actual what he needs to know, right? What he needs to be great at, what he needs to be, what he needs to be able to dominate at in order to get the, the kinds of, on the kinds of tracks in life that he wants to get to. Because if you marry up that kind of motivation to say, I want to design my own curriculum, with actual, with actual pathways about what you need to be able to prove in order to get where you're trying to go, boom, you've got something, right? And if you can marry that up with some solid game mechanics, you have yourself an autonomous learner that costs us close to nothing to educate, right? That is powerful, right? But I think that that's got to be done with, within the existing framework of institutions because these institutions we have play a really important role in the world, right? So that it can't be about getting rid of great, great schools. It's got to be about, about figuring out how to make them beneficiaries of the system as well. Okay, I'm going to take another question over here. Thanks. Uh, Mandeep Dillon, I'm the co-founder of a company called Togetherville that was uh, acquired by Disney recently. And I have kids the same age as yours. Mine are four, seven, and nine. And I've been making that assertion for a little while that at least one of them uh, will not be going to a four-year college and not because they're not intelligent. Um, I, I keep on reminding them of that. Um, but I think uh, it really does put a tremendous number of challenges on the feeding system that gets to these colleges and universities, whether they're two-year or four-year institutions. Do you guys have any thoughts on what needs to change over the course of the next decade to prepare this next generation of kids for this more independent learning system? Because we basically march them to the finish line and then say, go do something else. Totally. Um, and I think that's going to have to change as we start to think about that new system. I don't know if you have any thoughts on how that's going to evolve. I've struggled with this one. Um, I actually don't think that, I, I disagree with the point that K-12 is where the innovations happen. I think the innovations have to happen at the point of engagement with the, with the um, economy and then backwards integrate all the way through, right? So high school can't get fixed so long as it's feeding college. Middle school can't get fixed so long as it's feeding high school. But you have to start at the end and then work your way backwards. That's my, that's my perspective, simply. But I think it's happening the other way as well, too, though. I think there are big pockets of innovation um, in the K through 12 system that may force the, um, the universities to move forward. But I think it's going to be kind of disjointed for a while as we figure all of this out. And um, I think there might be, you know, some entrepreneurial opportunities to take 
the kids like you have that, that you know, need to um, find a different way to learn. And, and then I think a big issue is going to be is who's going to be setting up the credentials for what it is we want everybody you know, to be learning and all of this. So I think there's just, I mean, talk about disruptive. There's so many changes that are gonna have to take place. I, don't, I just don't see it as a smooth transition. Just a quick follow up, I think it's a great point. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing is um, we're working obviously with teachers on a daily basis, but working with Stanford as well to figure out ways to work from a professional development standpoint and teachers of how to use technologies and platforms really successfully. Um, I couldn't agree with Gunnar more, which is uh, I think you start, um, you start at the end point and almost have to peel it all the way back. And it's, um, it, I think it is going to be, to Pam's point, I think it's going to be very disjointed and fragmented for some time. And I think as a parent, frankly, there's just a lot of other challenges associated with that. Um, Michael Powell mentioned it earlier today, the idea of you want your children to obviously be as tech savvy as possible, and yet there's also something that's extraordinary and powerful of long form communication, of, um, you know, of obviously having, uh, experiencing a book. Um, in a way that is not so much, uh, and that doesn't have adaptive and gaming components to it, that is a, a more singular experience. So um, I, I think there's a lot of dynamics in play on that. I have a question over here. Hi, I'm Amory Wakefield from EA Corporation. Uh, my question is about, we're spending a lot of time talking about the content of the education, and I think particularly for top universities, not only their brand, but the collaboration and the discussion and the being surrounding yourself in a culture of students that are at that level that happens in a classroom. How do you, can you comment on how technology is going to affect that, particularly distance learning, how you create that collaboration and networking that is such a core piece of that learning? Yeah, I think the military's done, done this the best, actually, um, in, a, in a weird way. So before you go to flight school or before you go to any expensive school, you have to learn everything you need to be good at that school before you go, right? And I think that's what universities, what these leading universities become is these awesome places to go acquire intellectual assets, connect with people around building new, building new knowledge. They're knowledge creation factories, right? They are fantastic at it. They're like McKinsey. They're like, that's what I want to go, that's what, that's what you want to physically go there for. I don't need to go there for a lecture anymore. We have, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Busos. I'm from the uh, University of California. And I had a question uh, regarding the access to information. You, you talked a little bit about how it's important that we have access to the information that's out there. Um, there was, uh, last, last month, there was a bill that was introduced uh, to the House of Representatives, um, HR three, uh, I think it's, uh, 3699. And uh, it's regarding uh, access to uh, uh, public access uh, of information for NIH. And um, it effectively negates that, uh, that public access. How do you foresee uh, government's uh, role in, in all of this in terms of being able to access information so that we can have the information required to uh, give people quality degrees? Any, any one of you want to jump in? Go ahead. I mean, I, I, I'm actually someone that formerly worked, worked in the government. Um, and, um, I, I mean, I can't speak to the legislation. I don't, I don't know the piece of legislation. Um, I, I think that actually, I think this, specifically this, this DOE, this department has actually been, I, I think, um, uh, pretty forward thinking on looking at open source content and creating um, more of an open source environment for students. Um, frankly, both at the K-12 level as well as the higher ed level. To Andrew's earlier point, we have just, the reality is that we've become a society and we've become an educational system that needs to be and is continuing to be more data driven. And so there's just an extraordinary amount of data now that you're able, from an employer, but as a parent, as a teacher, as an instructor, as a student to have access to. And um, I do believe, and it was talked about earlier today, frankly, that um, government needs to play an even more active role, frankly, in making those investments that are, that are system oriented, that are cloud oriented, or that at least provide the private sector with more flexibility to bring those into um, into um, our traditional public school models, both at the, at the K-12 and the higher ed level. Because again, it, to me, it's very consumer driven. There's an expectation now of, of having access to that data, being able to, d to decipher it. Um, I know that um, as a parent now, but formerly, when I was very focused from a business standpoint on looking at information that was coming from report cards and data from standardized testing, majority of the consumers have no idea what that information means. As a parent, you get that information of where your child is, and that perspective is completely lost 
Um, there needs to be, frankly, um, a, a better approach from a cloud perspective to provide context and provide more access to that, that information. Um, you know, the private sector, government sector, I think like anything, it's a little bit of an integrated model of, of how that's going to be successful. Terrific. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, our wonderful panelists, uh, Andrew, Gunner, Pam, and Rusty.